right last class. Uh, we have Othello to get through, and we got a lot to get through because I um, have not even entered into Act 4, and I'm still in Act 3, and I need to do a little bit more about Act 3. Um, Act 3, let me begin with li uh, line uh, 260 in uh, Othello's soliloquy there, and then I'm going to build on that and go from there because in that he speaks of being under the influence of Iago and his uh, sway. And what uh, Iago has managed to do was uh, is under the auspices of being honest, yet um, Othello, who uh, is a man of courage and valor, uh, for whom there is an absolute integrity, what is on the outside mirrors what's on the inside. But what is on the outside in terms of his skin color is thereby irrelevant to him because he's a man of honor, he's not a man of appearance, and he's not a man, he's not a hypocrite. But what Iago has managed to do through the use of language and the perverse use of language, and I've said regularly he's an anti-dramaturge figure, we're going to see how far down the road that will go here because it's quite extraordinary in this, this play. Um, how he has managed to get all of the characters to act in accordance with their worst characteristics and to judge on the basis of appearances rather than on the basis of how things really are. He's made them, uh, in other words, slaves to their passions and judgmental on the basis of the most trivial things. And we will see that uh, in exemplified in this in the passage where and the connection with the symbolism of the handkerchief which is seen as a sign of guilt <coughs> because uh, what Iago manages to get Othello to do is to be convinced that his wife is guilty until she's proven innocent and as soon as the handkerchief is found in his mind she's already dead he it's just uh, the, the smallest uh, matter of, of evidence is going to persuade him. And what that manages to do, we saw him at the outset of the play and how uh, self-confident he was is the word I use, more of a psychological term, but it was more he is secure in who, who his identity is. Uh, he's a moral man and he acts in accordance with that and so he's not bothered by um, the allegations of others that don't really reflect upon him. But now, because of Iago, he is doing exactly what um, Iago did at the outset, is he's speaking of him in terms of his skin color and in terms of him being an outsider. It's, a, it's Othello that's talking this way. And of course, at that point, the integrity of the man has been lost. He's, been, he's effectively been his mind has been overthrown and his character will soon follow. So he's a gentle man towards his wife and then he's going to act in the most savage way. He actually smacks her in front of the Venetian official, uh, which is deplorable for a man to strike a woman in public. It's disgraceful and regarded as such by the Venetian. And anyway, this is, a, this is uh, Othello's speech. Uh, in response to Iago's entreating upon his honor to just leave it to him and he'll take care of it. Othello's speech 258. This fellow, referring to Iago, is of exceeding honesty and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, though that her Jessies were my dear heartstrings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Haply, for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversations that chamberers have, or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not much. She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. O oh, curse of marriage! that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapor of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing I love for others' uses. Yet tis the plague of great ones, prerogative uh, are they less than the base. Tis destiny unshunnable like death. Even then 
this forked plague is fated to us when we do quicken. Look where she comes. And then when she comes in, he says, if she be false, oh, then heaven mocks itself. I'll not believe it. So he, having said what he's just said, and in black, when he refers to himself for happily I am black, is he talking about his skin color? He could be. I think he's thinking more in terms of he's capable of, of, of uh, violence. It's obviously a play on the color, but I don't think he's really thinking about that, and I don't think he's bothered by that too much. Remember that the, the challenge for the modern reader is between Shakespeare and us lies the great African slave trade. Um, and, but it is between us. It, it is not there in Shakespeare's day. And there isn't the same. Um, they don't also suffer from the sort of racial theories that become prominent in the 18th century and, and really take on legs when Darwin's theory of the origin of species takes hold. And then social Darwinism in the 20th century with Nazi Germany and, and so forth. That, th that lies after the fact, and we see it through that lens, invariably. Like, it just, that's how we see things. So we take that w as a, very, a matter of utmost serious. I don't think it's really uh, the way the play should be read, and I think it's implausible for Shakespeare to have read it, written it that way. And um, so when these things arise, then the question comes to mind, what is the purpose of reading a great work of literature? Is it to promote modern social agendas? Is it to uh, be uh, taught something? Is it to be uh, improved in our character? Is it just to be entertained? What, what's the purpose in this? And, and for me, th and I've been consistent in saying this throughout the course, I want you to understand how Shakespeare's uh, audience would have intended or would have received it. And then, of course, we can get to, okay, well, how do I apply it now? And if I'm going to put this play on now, how would I portray the issues going on in Othello? Um, and, and anybody who's going to put it on stage is going to have to do that of necessity. You have to interpret it and you present it to your audience. And I, I'm not opposed to modern renderings of it, but for a, a, uh, an academic uh, context, let's try and see it the way Shakespeare's audience would have seen it, and then we may find that we look at uh, contemporary views on it a little bit differently with a bit of more sophistication. At any rate, the blackness here, um, it's, a, it's a symbol of something. In, in scripture, it's a symbol of, of evil, of, of sin, of violence, right? And, and red is, is a symbol of blood, and it's a symbol of sacrifice, but it's also a symbol of purity. And these are contradictory symbols because the cross changes the, the connotations of these. But if you read the book of Revelation and you'll find that colors are, are emphasized repeatedly, white and black and red, those three colors in particular. And they're not always connected with what you would expect them. But when he says, I am black here, I don't think he's talking about his skin color only even, or even Chiefly, I think he's thinking about his capacity for being uncivilized. And I don't think he, that he doesn't mean that as a racial thing in, in our sense. Uh, but at any rate, so he says, happily I am, for I am black, and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have. He's not saying because he's a black man. He's saying because he is a man of war. And so he's not been softened by society. He's able to act. So I'm going to just, I, she's done. I'm going to take care of the problem with great aggressiveness. And he regards himself as abused before it's even been proven. As I say, he's al she's already guilty in his eyes. And then when he sees her, he's struck by the contrast between her appearance and his love for her, which is renewed by just looking at her and what just happened in his mind's eye, which is seeing her as a loathsome creature. And he says, if she be false, oh, then heaven mocks itself, because she's the very picture of heaven. And he says, I'll not believe it. So he doesn't want to believe what he already believes. So what, what Iago has managed to do, and this is his 
an extension of what I said about his role as an anti-dramaturge figure, is that he has aroused Othello's imagination. Just like we saw in the very first play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, there's a darkness here. And, but it, here it's a spiritual darkness. They're not in the dark of the forest where you can't see clearly because there's no light that penetrates. Although the play often takes place at night, he's imagined her to be guilty because of what uh, Iago has insinuated. And he is thereby being led by his worse, baser instincts. His passions have overruled his reasoning. And they, he now presupposes her guilty. And then all the evidence is going to fit in with those presuppositions. He's just looking for one little piece of evidence. What's the piece of evidence going to be? Well, the handkerchief. The handkerchief, which is a symbol of her guilt. And it was a symbol of his love for her. Note that how symbols can change. So the poppy is a symbol of remembrance. For some, it's a symbol of the valorization of war. If you're a pacifist, and they don't like the symbol. In Northern Ireland, it's a symbol for uh, patriotism and unity with the United Kingdom. So if you tear up a poppy or you don't wear a poppy, you're saying something about the relation of Ireland to the United Kingdom. You don't want them to be related, so you don't wear the poppy. It's an imperial symbol. All of this is just saying symbols uh, can mean different things in different contexts. And the handkerchief goes from being a symbol of this to being a symbol of its antithesis very quickly because of Iago's terrible imaginative power. So he's the, he is the anti-playwright. He is exactly the thing that uh, Plato warned against and exactly the thing that Shakespeare regards as uh, his, anti his antithesis as well. Shakespeare wants to lead people to be virtuous. Iago wants them to be vicious and debase them. And he is now so open to any type of proof, no matter how slender. He, uh, Iago tells Othello he's seen uh, Desdemona's handkerchief in Cassio's possession. This is line 440, I believe. Um, 430 thereabouts. Tis a shrewd doubt, 428. Tis a shrewd doubt, though it be, but a dream, that, and this may help to thicken other proofs that do demonstrate thinly. And then Othello says, I'll tear her all to pieces. He's at this point outraged at the very thought of what is transpired before it's even been proved. You would have thought he would presume his faithful wife to be faithful to him, and it would be very hard to persuade him otherwise, but not so. He's awakened his envy. And that monster, having been loosed from his bosom, is now ruling the roost. So he's no longer a man in control of himself. He can't even govern himself, let alone govern others. And he's about to destroy the one who is uni united to him in the bond of marriage. But at any rate, she says, I'll tear her all to pieces. And then Iago continues with his mode of um, reverse psychology. Nay, nay, yet be wise. Yet we see nothing done. Every time he does this, he reduces his own um, reliance on his own intellect and his in because he's increasing his dependency on Iago. Because Iago gives him the counsel of don't be so hasty, don't be so hasty. Oh boy, I can really trust this guy. Because I, I believe that he, she's guilty, but he is pushing back against me, just like he did with Michael Cassio. So he insinuates himself into his confidence. There might be nothing here. She may be honest yet, says Iago. Tell me about this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one. Twas my first gift. I know not that. But such a handkerchief, I'm sure it was your wives, did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with. If it be that, if it be that or that any that was hers, it speaks against her with the other proofs. Oh, that the slave had 40,000 lives. One is too poor, too weak for my revenge. Now do I see tis true. 
Look here, Iago, all my fawn love thus I do blow to heaven. <sighs> Tis gone. Arise, black vengeance, from the hollow hell. Yield up, O love, thy crown and hearted throne to tyrannous hate. Swell bosom with thy fraught, for tis of aspics tongues. Now, poison. And again, the black vengeance. Color is not the issue. It's a malevolence. <clears throat> black malevolence. Yet be content. Oh, blood, blood, blood. Patience, I say. Your mind perhaps may change. Never, Iago, like to the Pontic Sea, whose icy current and compulsive course never feels retiring ebb, but keeps due on to the pre-Pontic and to the Hellespont, even so my bloody thoughts, with violent pace, shall never look back, ne'er ebb to humble love, till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up. And then he goes down on his knees. Now, this is an interesting passage. Now, by yon marble heaven, in the due reverence of a sacred vow, I here engage my words. Do not rise yet. And Iago kneels down beside him. Now, the two of them kneeling on the ground. Uh, anyone who is in a uh, Roman Catholic marriage ceremony or many Anglican ceremonies will have seen this before. It's the couple, they kneel down on the altar or the, right in front of the priest. Priest place the priest places his uh, scarf around their necks and so forth. And so there's a vow going on. Now he's united to his wife, but now they, he's vowing revenge and before heaven. Do not rise yet. Witness, you ever burning lights above, you elements that clip us round about. Witness that here Iago doth give up the execution of his wit. Hands, heart, to wrong to fellow's service. Let him command and to obey shall be in me remorse. What bloody business ever, and then they arise. I greet thy love, says Othello, not with vain thanks, but with acceptance bounteous, and will upon the instant put thee to it. Within these three days, let me hear thee say that Cassio's not alive. My friend is dead. Tis done at your request, but let her live. Damn her, lewd minx. Oh, damn her, damn her. Come go with me apart. I will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death for the fair devil. Now art thou my lieutenant. I am your own forever. So they are united in a vow, a marriage of sorts. So he's the, there's a, the, the anti-dramaturge. Now he's the anti-spouse. There's, black, there's bl deep spiritual blackness in this passage. Um, there's a sort of a, 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 I am your own forever. So it's the, the marital vow to death do us part. It's, it's, a, it's a consummation of the marriage and the consummation will be consummated by blood. The blood of the victim. So I, I don't think I'm reading into this. That Shakespeare is presenting this in exceedingly uh, symbolic in black terms. Now this, there's a tragic irony here, which is that the character's ignorance leads to his own tragic downfall. He's been calling Iago honest all along, all along while he's been dishonest. They're now united for the, the purpose, at least in Othello's eyes, of being honorable. He's about to do the most dishonorable thing one can imagine. He's going to throttle his wife in their marriage bed for no reason. It's a terrible, and a man who is by all honored for his noble character, which he has, uh, will be turned into the very, a very devil. <coughs> when Iago calls upon Othello to let Desdemona live, here's the question, and, and it's one for interpretation uh, by the character that plays Iago. Does he mean it? Or is he just doing what he's been doing all along and, and trying to sound like he's trying to moderate Othello when really he's egging him on. I'm not sure, but you could play it as Iago seeing this as going beyond his intent. He had intention to um, usurp Cassio and get Cassio's place, and now he's achieved that. 
you know, you kill him and you'll be my lieutenant. Does he really want to bring Desdemona's death about? Is that his intention? I'm not sure. So you could play that here that way. And Iago at this point is wanting to stop that. Like he's let the horses out of the barn and, but now he's to like, don't, don't murder her, but let me have that. Or you could see it as just the same strategy of reverse psychology. I don't know. I think there's, there's evidence that uh, uh, suggests that at least it's possible that Iago is seeing consequences that he did not intend. Like he has nothing against Desdemona per se, right? At any rate, um, as I say, the handkerchief is a visible sign of Desdemona's guilt. And note also that when he uh, invoked uh, black vengeance, he spoke of the aspic's tongues. Swell bosom with thy fraught, for tis of aspic's tongues. The bite of the serpent, just like the, the, the serpent in the garden. Um, so there's a, a great deal of here, if this is a couple of sorts, this is an Adam and Eve, and the serpent is their... Uh, co-partner in this. So the plot has been unleashed and uh, Desdemona, we'll see in the next uh, scene, is totally incapable of understanding jealousy. So line 104 um, speaks to this rather well. Uh, so 100, sorry. Uh, em uh, Emilia says, in response to uh, Othello flying out of the rooms in, in a rage, Zunzi says, Emilia says, is not this man jealous? And Desdemona, I ne'er saw this before. Sure, there's some wonder in this handkerchief. I am most unhappy in the loss of it. But, so what? It's a handkerchief. Yes, it was my gift and he, it really bothers him. So yes, I want it back, but would it lead him to, like, think about that somebody gave you a gift, would they want to kill you for losing the gift? Like that would be a, a little over, you know, I think a little over the top. And then Amelia, tis not a year or two, shows us a man. They are all but stomachs. And we all but food. They eat us hungrily, and when they are full, they belch us. <laughs> She's married to Iago. So again, take it in context. This is not a misandrist statement. It's the statement, or I mean, you could take it that way. Maybe she'd be a feminist icon for saying this. I don't know. But that's not, I don't think that that's Shakespeare's intention. This is a woman who's married to, uh, well, we've seen Iago's character. He's a, he's a bad guy. And she is the chief victim. She's married to him. And now she makes a comment on men. Well, of course she does, makes that comment on men. Universalizes it. And then Amelia, look you, Cassio and my husband. There is no other way, tis she, must, tis she must do it. And lo the happiness, go and importune her. How oh, now, good Cassio, what's the news with you? Madam, my former suit, I do beseech you that by your virtuous means I may again exist and be a member of his love whom I, with all the office of my heart, entirely honor. I would not be delayed if my offense be of such mortal kind that nor my service past, nor present sorrows, nor purposed merit in futurity can ransom me unto his love again, but to know so must be my benefit. So shall I clothe me in a forced content and shut myself up in some other course to fortune's alms. Alas, thrice gentle Cassio, my advocation is not now in tune. My Lord is not my Lord, nor should I know him were he in favor as in humor altered. So help me every spirit sanctified. For as I have spoken for you all my best and stood within the blank of his displeasure for my free speech, you must a while be patient. What I can do, I will. And more I will than for myself, I dare. Let that suffice you. Is my lord angry, says Iago? Amelia, he went hence but now, and certainly in strange unquietness. Can he be angry? I have seen the cannon when it hath blown his ranks into the air, and like the devil from his very arm puffed his own brother. 
And is he angry? Something of moment then. I will go meet him. There's something in it indeed if he be angry. I prithee do it. Everyone thinks Iago is acting in everyone's best interest. So he's deceiving everyone, including his wife, by the way. Now his wife's in on the handkerchief. She knows about that, but she doesn't know the malign intention here. It's just, it's just a handkerchief. She's doing what her husband asked her to do, and, but it, it's not, he's, she's tr he's trying to destroy Desdemona and Othello with him. That never enters into her mind. So she is being, she is complicit in the act, but not in the, uh, the full intention of the act. So she, there is a part in which she's complicit here. There's no doubt about this, but the, it's not, she's not a uh, Lady Macbeth type figure, if you want to compare the two again. She's not, nothing like that. She's as much uh, sinned against as sinning here. Um, so she sees his nefarious purposes, but she's not privy to the scheme. And, but what she does recognize, and this is the uh, speech that I just read, line 105, that men are bestial creatures. They're moved by their passions. They're just bodies, and they eat us and belch us, and we're their food. So she also thinks of men in the worst possible terms. In the same way that Iago has been speaking of women in the same terms. And all of it because he has not been honored. And honor is not a material category. It's a, it's a moral category. And so he wants to th overthrow all morality, all m moral considerations. It's consistent throughout Shakespeare's plays. When, when uh, King Lear gets rid of the, uh, the political legitimacy of hierarchy, he overthrows the familial legitimacy of hierarchy, father, children, and the moral legitimacy of um, nobility. He wants his daughters to act nobly towards him, but he's got rid of the very basis for no noble action. They all hang together for Shakespeare, though. That's the point. So when, when Iago is slighted in his, um, you know, he doesn't get the high rank that he thinks he deserves, he just gets rid of all ranking. All morality goes out with it. He regards them as of no significance. Um, I don't think a modern playwright would ever present it this way, but Shakespeare does because that's how his universe lines up. There's a moral hierarchy. There's a hierarchy within the human person. There's a hierarchy within the family. There's a hierarchy within nature. And there's a hierarchy in, in the um, cosmos. The sun governs the other planets and so forth. Right? So there's hierarchy everywhere, and they all connect. So you break one of them, and it breaks all over the place. So this really is a play about the soul, though. And this is what I said at the outset. And it's mentioned repeatedly throughout the play, the reference to the soul. And when um, uh, it's most often mentioned in the crisis scenes, like, like these ones here. When Desdemona speaks of her love for her husband, she refers to her heart, her soul, and her body, the whole of her. In uh, Christian marriage vows, it actually, um, in the traditional vows in the Anglican church, it will say, with my body, I thee worship. With my body, which sounds almost um, unchristian, but it, it's the exact opposite, right? Because it's your, 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 your self, your soul is connected to your body. You can't worship somebody with your soul. And this is part of uh, Othello's problem. He loves his wife intellectually, but doesn't love her physically. Where she has a much bigger and more comprehensive sense of love. He, she loves her husband entirely, and she wants to be united with him physically. He's a very physically strong man, but he loves his wife more for her for her mind and she loves him chiefly for her mind but not only whereas he seems to have a more platonic sense of who she is so what at, at uh, issue here is the soul and the whole person and how does one act as a whole person and so there's an idea of the hierarchy within the mind i've talked about this repeatedly and i'll just there there is such a thing as a divine intelligence the mind of god which we access by scanning the created order. We look at the book of nature 
But more than that, there's the book of grace, and that reveals us to, to us who God is and what his purposes are. So those two books, uh, Shakespeare would call that, and that will inform our reason. So the, the two books here by which we understand the mind uh, of God. And then the reason is to inform the will to subdue the passions. But within the individual, the, these three parts are there. And Shakespeare is regularly talking about the uses of the will uh, malevolently to uh, allow the passions to rule over the reason. We saw that back in Midsummer Night's Dream. So this is the individual, and the individual is, it's not that the reason is, it, and the passions are disconnected or unconnected. So in Plato's view, the mind and the body are totally unrelated. The body is the enemy of the mind. It's, it's a prison house for the soul, right? The body's a prison house. But for a Christian, that's not the case. The body is actually part of our nature and an important part. Remember, Christ takes on a body. And in Romans 12, verse 1, it says, offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, for this is your spiritual act of worship. And that's emphasized here. So we can't divorce the passions entirely and they are, they are to be brought into line with the reasoning so that the passions which are good are governed appropriately and they're all governed by relation to God. That's what Shakespeare has in mind here but when Othello and the dispute in the play is about the soul, the soul is the whole of all this. Othello re repeatedly tries to reduce it to material things or things that to, over which the passions rule. And so we judge on the basis of appearances. Now this, by the way, this hierarchy of the mind is the Elizabethan view. Uh, it's, not a, it's not what modern philosophy will say. It's not a problem-solving mechanism. That's Descartes. You know, how do we get to over the problem of, of um, doubt? How do we overcome that? Is it through our senses, empirical means, or is it through reason, divorce from empiric? Like, is it those? But it's a problem-solving mechanism. That's not the Elizabethan view. The Elizabethan view involves the whole person. Anyway, so um, on to Act Four here, and now I'm running very short on time. Um, in Act Four, we really see Othello's loss of the soul, and and at the point at which his dehumanization reaches it reaches its lower, lowest ebb. And it's when he gets the visible proof of the thing that he already decided upon, namely his wife's guilt. And Iago is a mediator. He's the intermediary in all these things. He, he arranges himself between Othello and Cassius, or Cassio rather. And that allows him to orchestrate both men. So when the one's out of the room, he can prime the, that character, and when the other's out of the room, he can say something different. And so he is the one who's pulling the strings on the stage. And as I say, Iago, and this is, this is a perversity of the human heart in some ways. I think the reason that Iago is so effective is because Othello almost wants the worst thing possible to be true. Because as noble as the man is, he's a sinner. And there's something in that of the self-absorption that goes along with this. So as I say, Iago's a sort of go-between. Bianca, who enters the scene here, is somebody that Cassio is following Iago's footsteps. He despises this, this girl, but he uses her in the same way that we find that uh, Iago does repeatedly. And we find that just as, so back in the previous scene, Act 3, Scene 3, um, Othello just referred to his mind like the Pontic Sea. So it's a, it's a turbulent, chaotic force. It's, he's no longer an ordered being. His passions are overruling his reason. He's all over the place. And now we see the out come of that and it's and I would say that scene is a has a parallel to Shakespeare's 
uh, King Lear where he's on the heath screaming at the wind. It's a tempest. So there's a disorder in nature, a chaos in nature, which is reflecting the chaos of his mind, the fact that he's not ruling himself. He's already thrown off political rule, familial rule. Now his mind itself is disorderly. Uh, in the same way here, um, we find that um, Othello falls into an epilepsy. So it's a, it's a fascinating passage in some way. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead it up a little bit. So uh, Iago tells Othello about uh, the fact that he see, saw them kissing and so forth and the fact that he saw them naked in bed, but they didn't mean any harm. <laughs> there wasn't really anything going on. You know, there's, I don't know, he happened to be naked, but that, I'm sure there's nothing going on. And then Othello, naked in bed, Iago, and not mean harm. It is hypocrisy against the devil. They that mean virtuously and yet do so, the devil their virtue tempts, and they tempt heaven. If they do nothing, tis a venial slip. So they're naked as long as they're not like nothing. It's just, well, it's not, it's just a small thing. But if I give my, but if I give my wife a handkerchief, so that you can overlook. If they were naked in bed together, they just, they're just happen to be there, but there's nothing going on. But if you find the handkerchief, then it's over, yeah. But we're, we're not going to find that. What, what then? Why then, tis hers, my lord, and being hers, she may, I think, bestow it on any man. She is protectress of her honor, too. May she give that. Her honor, says Iago, is an essence that's not seen. They have it very oft that have it not. But for the handkerchief, so as, it, as he points out to him, honor is something that you can't necessarily see. It's, an, uh, it's a product of the character of the individual. Sometimes people don't look very honorable. That doesn't mean that they aren't. It can be, but the handkerchief on the other hand is a, it's a clear indicator. All these are specious forms of argumentation. The arguments are sound, but the application here doesn't fit, but he keeps on doing that. And so he, what he builds is the case for the, the, for the handkerchief as the in, uh, or the, Im the impossibly uh, clear proof of her guilt. And her said, her, um, by heaven I would most gladly have forgot it. Thou saidst, oh, it comes o'er my memory as doth the raven or the infectious house, boding to all. He had my handkerchief. Aye, what of that? That's not so good now. What? It, what if I had said I had seen him do you wrong, or heard him say, as knaves be such abroad, who having by their own importunate suit or voluntary dotage of some mit mistress convinced or supplied them, cannot choose but they must blab. Hath he said anything? He hath, my lord, but... but be you well assured, no more than he'll unswear. <laughs> he'll deny what I've just said, so never mind what he's going to say. What hath he said? Faith, what he did. I know not what he did. What? What? L lie with her? With her? On her. <laughs> what you will. Lie with her. Lie on her. We say lie on her when they belie her. Lie with her. Zunes, that's fulsome. Handkerchief. Confessions. Handkerchief. To confess and be hanged for his labor. First to be hanged and then to confess. I tremble at it. Nature would not invest herself in such shadowing passion without some instruction. It is not words that shakes me thus. Pish. Noses, ears, and lips, it's possible. Confess, handkerchief, oh devil, Pfft, falls into a trance. Work on my medicine, work. Thus credulous fools are caught, and many worthy and chaste dames even thus all guiltless meet reproach. What ho, my lord, my lord, I say, Othello, enter Cassio. How now, Cassio? What's the matter? My Lord has fallen into an epilepsy. This is his second fit. He had one yesterday. Rub him about the temples. No, forbear. 
The lethargy must have his quiet course. If not, he foams at the mouth and by and by breaks out to savage madness. Look, he stirs. Do you withdraw yourself a little? Do you withdraw yourself a little while? He will recover straight. When he is gone, I would on great occasion speak with you. Cassio goes out. How is it, General, says Iago to Othello? Have you not hurt your head? <laughs> Dost thou mock me? I, I mock you not, by heaven. Would you bear your fortune like a man? A horned man's a monster and a beast. He's a cuckold, a horned beast. He's a monster and a beast. Iago, there's many a beast then in a populous city and many a civil monster. Did he confess it? Good sir, be a man. Think every bearded fellow that's but yoked may draw with you? There's millions now alive that nightly lie in those unproper beds, which they dare swear peculiar. Your case is better. Oh, tis the spite of hell, the fiend's arch mock, to lip a wanton in a secure couch, and to suppose her chaste? No, let me know, and knowing what I am, I know what she shall be. Oh, thou art wise, tis certain. Stand you a little while apart, confine yourself but in a patient list. Whilst you are here, overwhelmed with your grief, a passion most unsuiting such a man, Cassio came hither, so he's rebuking him for his loss of self-control. Right? You're not a, you know, man up. Be a man. He's reduced him as a man to this wretch on the ground who loses his consciousness, and he's quivering here. I, 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 Shakespeare probably doesn't have a great deal of understanding of how epilepsy works and so forth, right? But I mean, anyway. Uh, and it's probably not epilepsy. He says that it's epilepsy, but in fact, he's fainted. He's brought a man of war to faint at the thought of this, and now he's being accused by uh, Iago of not being much of a man. Sounds a lot like Lady Macbeth. Do but encave yourself and mark the fleers, the jibes and notable scorns that dwell in every region of his face, for I will make him tell the tale anew. Where, how, how oft, how long ago, and when he hath, and is again to cope your wife. He hath, and uh, he, I say, but mark his gesture, Mary, patience, or I shall say, you're all in spleen and nothing of a man. You're all this and nothing of man. If you don't be patient, if you don't govern yourself, even while what he's doing is making him be nothing but that. Right? So again, it's repeated reverse psychology here. Uh, the language, by the way, when Othello, this, this speech of his, which is totally disordered, he's um, using the, the, the figure which has been used repeatedly in this play and is in other plays, the, it's a rhetorical figure called anacoluthon. It's at words that don't follow. The syntax is totally garbled. It's often with, with dashes. He's not making sense. So the fact that his passions are overruling, like you, you get this like yourselves when you're really irate, you lose the capacity to speak coherent sentences. When I say you, um, we all do this. If we're in that great a rage, your, your, your capacity to speak rationally goes with it. So it's a reflection of the loss of self-control. And he uses through this, this figure uh, of syntax. But anyway, uh, whereas Iago speaks uh, in clear terms here, and his speech is very orderly. So he's in control, and he's in control of Othello. And dost thou hear, Iago, I will be found most cunning in my patience, but dost thou hear most bloody? That's not a miss but yet keep time in all. Will you withdraw? And then he withdraws. Now, says Iago, will I question Cassio of Bianca. Now, does he say this to himself? Because he's now on the stage alone. Does he walk up stage and does he confide in the audience and implicate them in the act? I think you could do that. And it, that again, that's up to the actor. Is he going to read, is, is this just thinking in his mind, which is what the soliloquy is? Or is he drawing, breaking through the fourth wall and pulling the audience into his confidence and making them despise him? 
Now will I question Cassio of Bianca, housewife that by selling her desires, buys herself bread and clothes. It is a creature that dotes on Cassio, as tis the strumpet's plague to beguile many and be beguiled by one. He, when he hears of her, cannot restrain from the excess of laughter. Here he comes. So he's going to go to uh, the, a woman who is effectively like what they're accusing uh, Desdemona of. So this is a woman who is, um, is poor but is selling her body for the sake of bread and clothing and happens to love Michael Cassio. And Michael Cassio thinks nothing of her. But then he will use her. Uh, to uh, get back his honor. And again, this degrades him. How do you gain your honor by treating another person dishonorably? Can't. But he does. And again, so here's Othello or Iago pulling the strings. Um, so she comes in and he leads, um, Cassio asks her to work with him. Uh, line 156, how now, my sweet Bianca? Bianca means white, by the way. How now, how now? Othello, by heaven, that should be my handkerchief. And Bianca, and you'll come to supper tonight? You may, and you will not. Come when you are next prepared for. After her, after her. Cassio, faith, I must. She'll rail in the streets else. Will you sup there? F faith, I intend so. Well, I may chance to see you, for I would very fain speak with you. Prithee, come. Will you? Go to, say no more. Cassio goes out. Now Othello comes out, having overheard the conversation. How shall I murder him, <laughs> Iago? Did you perceive how he laughed at his vice? Oh, Iago, and did you see the handkerchief? Was that mine, yours, by this hand? And to see how he prizes the foolish woman, your wife, she gave it him, and he hath given it his whore. I would have him nine years a killing. A fine woman, a fair woman, a sweet woman. Nay, you must forget that. He mustn't think good thoughts of his wife, because that will prevent him from the deed. He has to denigrate her in his speech first. Now this is a, something that the Nazis particularly did. It's called an excremental assault. You get people to um, do things that are contemptible. Carry poop. Does anyone want to do that for a living? No, but some people do it. We tend to do that when we, when we associate, we see this is menial work, this is servant's work, and it's degrading work. If you, in addition to that, call the person who carries the thing a name, then you start to diminish the person as a person. And this is what Iago is doing. He is diminishing people as people. So he mustn't say good things about his wife and her good sides. He must not talk about them. So you have to talk about the Jews as cockroaches or whatever. So you have to dehumanize them in your speech. And then that allows you to get rid of them without any moral quandaries. That is exactly what's going on here. So when he says a fine woman of his wife, a fair woman, a sweet woman, nay, you must forget that. Oh, let her rot and perish and be damned tonight, for she shall not live. No, my heart is turned to stone. I strike it and it hurts my hand. Oh, the world hath not a sweeter creature. She may lie by an emperor's side and command him tasks. So this is a man in Othello here speaking out of two sides. There's a debate within him. There's a Smeagol Gollum thing going on here. I'm going to murder her. She's a wicked thing. It's a stone. I'm going to hurt my hand. She is stone. She is not. She has no heart. On the other hand, then he's going back and forth. He's, he's torn in himself. And then, and she may lie by an emperor's side and command him tasks. That's how wonderful she is. And then Iago, nay, that's not your way. Hang her, I do but say what she is. So delicate with her needle, an admirable musician. Oh, she will sing the savageness out of a bear. Oh, so high and plenty is wit and invention. She's the worse for all this. So as beautiful and wonderful and accomplished as she is, that she should do such a thing makes her an even more wicked creature. So he has to denigrate her. 
and he has to get Othello to accept that in order for him to murder her, because otherwise he could not bring himself to do it. And then Othello, oh, a thousand, a thousand times, and then of so gentle a condition, I, too gentle, nay, that's certain, but yet the pity of it, Iago, oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago, if you are so fond over her iniquity, give her patent to offend, allow her to do so. Give her permission. For if it touch not you, it comes near nobody. I will chop her into messes. Cuckold me. Oh, tis foul in her. With mine officer. That's fouler. Get me some poison, Iago. This night I'll not expostulate with her, lest her body and beauty unprovide my mind again. This night, Iago. Do it not with poison, strangle her in her bed, even the bed she hath contaminated. Good, good, the justice of it pleases, very good. And for Cassio, let me be his undertaker. You shall hear more by midnight. Excellent good. And then the trumpet, what trumpet is that same? I warrant something from Venice. Now to Lodovico, Desdemona and the attendants come in and the Iago says, tis Lodovico. This comes from the Duke, see? Your wife's with him. God save you, worthy general, says Lodovico Othello, with all my heart, sir. The Duke and the senators of Venice greet you. I kiss the instrument of their pleasures. Opens the letter and reads, and what's the news, good cousin Lodovico? I am very glad to see you, Signor, says Iago. Welcome to Cyprus. I thank you. How does Lieutenant Cassio? Live, sir. Cousin, there's fallen between him and my lord an unkind breach, but you shall make all well. <laughs> Are you sure of that, my lord? And then he reads, because he's angry at the fact that she's defensive of Cassio, which again, more sign not, no longer of her noble character and her Christ-like desire to uh, rehabilitate him, but rather of her uh, complicit guilt and her lust for um, him. Oh, most unhappy one. So this fail not to do as you will, as he's written. He did not call. He's busy in the paper. Is there division twixt my lord and Cassio? A most unhappy one. I would do much to atone them for the love I bear to Cassio. Note the phrase, to atone them. She casts herself in the role of a, a redemptress here. Some have seen this as, again, and this is often uh, uh, Catholic readings will suggest that she's a sort of a Mary figure. Um, I think there's obviously a uh, place for that, although I don't see why you need to have Mary for that. This is just a Christian woman. Right? It doesn't have to be the ex uh, mother of God. But um, I, so it's the most unhappy one. I would do much to atone them for the love I bear to Cassio. Fire and brimstone! My lord, are you wise? What, is he angry? May be the letter moved him, for as I think they do command him home, deputing Cassio in his government. By my troth, I am glad on it. Indeed, my lord, I am glad to see you mad. Why, sweet Othello, says it, Desdemona. Devil! He's glad, he interprets her statement that she's glad to see Cassio placed in a position of authority as a, a sign that he's been rehabilitated in public life, an honorable man. Good. He sees it as he's glad that, that Cassio has taken his place there and he's out. So she prefer it's a sign again that she prefers Cassio to him. And so he strikes her openly in front of Lodovico. I have not deserved this. My Lord, this would not be believed in Venice, though I should swear I saw it. Tis very much. Make her amends. She weeps. Oh, devil, devil, if that the earth could teem with women's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile. Out of my sight. I, I will not stay to offend you. 
truly an obedient lady, says Lodovico. I do beseech your lordship, call her back. Mistress, my lord, what would you, what would you with her, sir? Who, I, my lord? I, you did wish that I would make her turn. She, sir, she can turn and turn and yet go on and turn again. And she can weep, sir, weep. And she's obedient, as you say, obedient, very obedient. Proceed you in your tears. Concerning this, sir, oh, well, painted passion. I am commanded home. Get you away. I'll send for you anon. Sir, I obey the mandate and will return to Venice. Hence, avaunt. So he calls her in order, order to upbraid her. Got a turncoat. Cassio shall have my place, and sir, tonight I do entreat that we may sup together. You are welcome, sir, to Cyprus, goats and monkeys. And then he goes out, and then Lodovico, is this the noble Moor whom our full senate call all in all sufficient? Is this the nature whom passion could not shake, whose solid virtue the shot of accident nor dart of chance could neither graze nor pierce. So the man who was imperturbable, he was unmovable. He was in control of his passions in the midst of battle while bullets are raining around his ears and swords are being wielded against him. Nothing moves him. Man of true virtue, Iago, he is much changed. <laughs> are his wits safe? Is he not light of brain? He's that he is. I may not breathe my censure what he might be. If what he might be he is not, I would to heaven he were. What? Strike his wife? Faith, that was not so well. Yet would I knew, would I knew that stroke would prove the worst. Is it his use? Or did the letters work upon his blood and knew create this false? Was he accustomed to beating his wife, or is it something that he read in the letter? Iago, alas, alas, it is not honesty in me to speak what I have seen and known. You shall observe him, and his own courses will denote him so that I may save my speech. But do not go after, but no, but go after, and mark how he continues. I am sorry that I am deceived in him. So now his public reputation is in ruins. So it's not just he's been, he's been taken out of the um, governance of Cyprus. Well, I mean, they don't need a fellow there. It's, they haven't pulled him for any reason uh, of uh, character or so forth. But now his character is much in doubt. And this is really what uh, uh, Iago's intent on is destroying him. Now, what we will find in the scenes that follow is that Iago's deception comes through speech and in the end, we will find that Othello loses control of his own language. Iago speaks of, of, of lying, and at first it becomes incoherent and falls down. Eventually, he's not able to speak at all and falls into a coma. Now, this is a fall from his humanity. Because again, to bear the image of God is to have the capacity to speech, to be responsible, to be morally responsible, to govern others through language, to govern ourselves, to govern our souls through the words that come out of our mouths. And he's now rendered like a brute. He's incapable of speaking. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a theological perversion. Um, where am I going to pick this up? It's hard to pull things together here. Um, let me come to Act 5, Scene 1. But, or, or the end of Act 4, and then we'll... Uh, so Act 4, Scene 3... We have uh, Lodovico, Othello, Desdemona, Emilia, and attendants, Lodovico, so the Venetian um, representative of the Senate. I do beseech you, sir, trouble yourself no further. Oh, pardon me, twill do me good to walk. And then they, dis they dismiss Othello. Madam, good night. I humbly thank your ladyship. Your honor is most welcome. Othello, will you walk, sir? Oh, Desdemona? My lord, get you to bed on the instant. I will be returned forthwith. Dismiss your attendant there. Look, be done. I will, my lord. Exit. 
Othello, Lodovico, in attendance. Amelia and Desdemona are left on the stage. How goes it now? He looks gentler than he did. He says he will return incontinent and hath commanded me to go to bed and bid me to dismiss you. Dismiss me? It was his bidding. Therefore, good Amelia, give, give me my knightly we wearing and adieu. He must not now, we must not now displease him. I would you had never seen him. So, so would not I. I love, my love doth so approve him that even his stubbornness, his checks, his frowns, prithee, unpin me, have grace and favor in them. So she's helping her take her clothes off, right? unpin me. I have laid those sheets you bade me on the bed. All's one. Good faith, how foolish are our minds. If I do die before thee, prithee shroud me in one of these same sheets. Come, come, you talk. Desdemona, my mother had a maid called Barbary. Now the Barbary coast is the North African coast. She was in love and she loved, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I have much to do but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbary. Prithee dispatch. Shall I go fetch your nightgown? No, unpin me here. This Lodovico is a proper man, a very handsome man. He speaks well. I know a lady in Venice would have walked barefoot to Palestine for a touch of his nether lip. <laughs> singing the poor, and then I'm not going to sing <laughs> the thing, but she's singing willow, willow, willow. Uh, the weeping willow, right? And talking about uh, this, the, the man who's gone mad. Remember that uh, when uh, Ophelia dies, it's in willows and she dies in the stream. It's a symbol of more, a natural symbol of mourning. And in this case, it expresses the fact that the man that she loved from the Barbary had gone mad and she thinks that her husband's gone mad, but she's going to submit herself to him all the same. And, all, and, and fears, I think there's some fear on both of their parts about what is going to transpire, but she goes happily to this. Uh, 54, I called my love false love, but what said he then, saying willow, 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 if I court mo woman, you'll couch with mo men, so I get thee gone, good night. Mine eyes do itch, doth that bode weeping? Tis neither here nor there. I've heard it said so. Oh, these men, these men, dost thou in conscience think, tell me, Amelia, that there be women do abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? Why, would not you? No, by this heavenly night, nor I neither by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. <laughs> Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? The world's a huge thing. It is a great price for a small vice. Good troth, I think thou wouldst not. By my troth, I think I, I should and undo it when I had done it. So I would strike him and then I'd, I'd say I felt sorry for it. That, that's what I would do. I'd, but Mary, I would not do such a thing for a joint ring, nor by measures of lawn, nor for gowns, petticoats, nor caps, nor any petty exhibition, but for all the whole world? It's pity who would not make her husband a cuckold to make him a monarch. I should venture purgatory for it. The Lady Macbeth. Beshrew me if I would do such a wrong for the whole world. She would not do an evil thing. For a good outcome, I would not do a thing, such a thing. Why? The wrong is but a wrong in the world. And having the world for your labor, tis a wrong in your own world, and you might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes, a dozen, and as many to the, so now we have two women talking about the nature of women and about the nature of virtue and the differences between women. Are there women who will do vicious things 
for a good outcome? Yes, there are, just like there are men. Um, and Desdemona is not, is not such a woman. She would not do a wicked thing for a, an advantage if it were to gain the whole world. She would not, and in the reader's mind, is the uh, language, it profiteth not a man to lose the whole world, but uh, t uh, to gain the whole world rather, but to lose his soul. It's all about the soul once again. She would not do it upon her soul. She would not do such a thing. And she, but, but Amelia says, oh yes, there are many women, a dozen, and as many to, ta to the advantage as would store the world they play for. But I do think it is their husband's fault if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us, or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Why, they, we, ha we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have sense like them, they see and smell and have their palates, both for sweet and sour, as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is it frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport, and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. Good night, good night. God me such uses send. Not so pick bad from bad, but by bad mend. I will not indulge in the vicious tit for tat, measure for measure. I will not do that. They may do it, I won't. I will mend, the. I will redeem the bad with good and overcoming evil with good, that sort of language. It's powerful, wonderful uh, heroine here. Resolve to the end, and it will be the end. So Act 5, Iago and uh, Rodrigo, uh, the, pl the plot is now uh, almost to its end. I'm going to skip over that and come to uh, the scene 2, because we have little time left. This is the where a Othello Othello, rather, enters with a light and Desdemona and her bed asleep. That's important staging. Shakespeare doesn't give us much, but when he does, it's essential. Here he has a light. It's dark, pitch dark, and he has a light in his hand. It's not going to stay, but it's, it's there. And Othello, who comes to murder his wife. It is the cause. It is the cause. My soul. Now he speaks to his soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause, yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, or else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore. Should I repent me? But once put out thy light, thou cunningst pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. So there are two lights. There's the light of his candle, which he can relight, and then there's the light of her life, which cannot be relit by any heat or any fire. When I have plucked thy rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It needs must wither. I'll smell thee on the tree. Kisses her. O balmy breath that dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. One more, one more. Be thus when thou art dead, and I will kill thee and love thee after. One more. He keeps kissing her. One more. And that, that's the last. So sweet as ne'er so, was ne'er so fatal. I must weep. But they are cruel tears. This sorrow's heavenly. It strikes where it doth love. She wakes. Who's there? Othello. I, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? Aye, my lord. If you think yourself of any crime unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, 
solicit for it straight. Alack, my lord, what may you mean by that? Well, do it, and be brief. I will walk by. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. No heaven forfend, I will not kill thy soul. Talk you of killing? I, I do. Then heaven have mercy on me. Amen, with all my heart. If you say so, I hope you will not kill me. Hmm. <laughs> and yet I fear you, for you're fatal then when your eyes roll so. Why I should fear I know not, since guiltless I know not. Guiltiness, rather, I know not. But yet I feel I fear. Think on thy sins. They are loves I bear to you. I and for that thou diest. That, that death's unnatural that kills for loving. Alas, why gnaw you so your nether lip? Some bloody passion shakes your very frame. These are portents, but yet I hope, I hope they do not point on me. Peace and be still. I will so. What's the matter? That handkerchief which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. No, by my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed, take heed of perjury. Thou art on thy deathbed. I, but not yet to die. Yes, presently, therefore confess me freely of thy sin. For to deny each article with oath cannot remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan with all. Thou art to die. Then Lord have mercy on me. I say, Amen. And have you mercy too. I never did offend you in my life. Never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might love. I never gave him token. By heaven, I saw my handkerchief in his hand. O oh, perjured woman, thou dost stone my heart and makest me call when I, what I intend to do a murder, which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the handkerchief. He found it then. I never gave it him. Send for him hither. Let him confess a truth. He hath confessed. What, my lord, that he hath used thee? How? Unlawfully. I. He will not say so. No. His mouth is stopped. Honest Iago had tain order for it. Oh, my fear interprets. What? Is he dead? Had all his hairs been lives? My great revenge had stomach for them all. Alas! He is betrayed and I undone. Uh, out strumpet, weeps thou for him to my face? Oh, banish me, my lord, but kill me not. Down, strumpet, kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight. Nay, and you strive, but half an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But while I say one prayer, it is too late. Smother, sir. Oh, Lord, 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 at the door, Amelia. My lord, my lord, what ho, my lord, my lord. What noise is this? Not dead, not yet quite dead. I that am cruel am yet merciful. I would not have thee linger in thy pain. So, so. Amelia within. What ho, my lord, my lord, who's there? Oh, good, my lord, I would speak a word with you. It's Amelia, by and by. She's dead. Tis like she comes to speak of Cassio's death. The noise was high. Ha! No more moving, still is the grave. Shall she come in? Were it good, I think she stirs again. No? What's best to do? If she come in, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife! My wife! What wife? I have no wife. Oh, insupportable. Oh, heavy hour, methinks I should now be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon and the affrighted globe did yawn at alteration. So he, now he's horrified by what he's done. Cassio will be, uh, we have to come to the very end of this, all of this. Um, um, Iago is going to be betrayed uh, or, or revealed in all this by his wife, Emilia. She will expose him. And what is the matter, says uh, Gratiano, 172. What's the matter? Disprove this villain. If thou beest a man, he says thou toldst him that his wife was false. I know thou didst not. Thou art not such a villain. Speak, for my heart is full. Saying this to Iago. 
I told him what I thought and told him no more than what he found himself was apt and true. But did you ever tell him she was false? I did. You told a lie, an odious damn lie upon my soul, a lie, a wicked lie. She false with Cassio, did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, mistress, go to, charm your tongue. I will not charm my tongue, I am bound to speak. My mistress here lies murdered in her bed. And then everyone, oh, heavens forfend, and your reports have set the murder on. Nay, the fellow says, stare not, masters, it is true indeed. Tis a strange truth, oh, monstrous act. Villainy, 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 I think upon it, I think I... I smell it, oh villainy, I thought so then, I'll kill myself for grief, oh villainy, villainy. What, says Iago, are you mad? I charge you, get you home. Good gentleman, let me have, let me have leave to speak. Tis proper, I obey him, her husband, but not now. Perchance, Iago, I will ne'er go home. And then Othello collapses, oh, 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 again. Nay, lay thee down and roar, for thou hast killed the sweetest innocent that ne'er did lift up eye. And then Othello rises up. Oh, she was foul. I scarce did know you, uncle. There lies your niece, whose breath indeed these hands have newly stopped. I knew this act shows horrible and grim. Poor Desdemone, tis pitiful. And then Amelia. O oh God, O oh heavenly God, and Iago. Zeus, hold your peace. Twill out, twill out. I, peace, no, I will speak as liberal as the north. Let heaven and men and devils, let them all, all, all cry shame against me, yet I'll speak. Be wise and get you home. I will not. And then he, he, he's got his knife out. And then Graziano, your sword upon a woman. Oh, thou dull moor, that handkerchief thou speaks of, I found by fortune and did give my husband for often with a solemn earnestness more than indeed belonged to such a trifle he begged of me to steal it villainous whore she gave it cassio no alas i found it and i did give it my husband filth thou liest by heaven i do not i do not gentlemen oh murderous coxcomb what would should such a fool do with so good a wife are there no stones in heaven but that serves for the thunder. Precious villain, and he runs at Iago, because he knows Iago's. And Montano disarms him, and Iago kills his wife. So it's her last speech and last act. So he's exposed. And uh, Iago caught up for what he is. Othello uh, repents. 271, where should Othello go? Now, how dost thou look now? O ill-starred wench, pale as thy smock. When we shall meet at Compt, before the God, the judge of all things, our accounts being read, at when we shall meet at Compt, this look of mine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch at it. Cold, cold, my girl, even like thy chastity. O cursed, cursed slave, whip me, ye devils from the possession of this heavenly sight. Blow me about in winds, roast me in sulfur, wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. Oh, Desdemone dead, Desdemone dead, oh, oh. Uh, last speeches of the play. Uh, by the way, Iago refuses to speak in the end. Having used his tongue like a serpent, uh, he will not speak. And uh, I'll read Lodovico's speech at the end. I'm going to skip over Iago's cause, or Othello's because I have no time. Lodovico to Iago. Again, Iago not even speaking. Oh, Spartan dog, more fell than anguish, hunger, or the sea. Look on the tragic loading of his bed. This is thy work. The object poisons sight. Let it be hid. Gratiano, keep the house and seize upon the fortunes of the moor, for they succeed on you. To you, Lord Governor, remains the censure of this hellish villain. The time, the place, the torture, oh, enforce it. Myself will straight aboard, and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relate. That's the end of it. So he leaves him to the um, justice of Cassio, who will uh, 
enact all, and he, he calls upon him to torture him. He's unrepentant. He's sitting there silently, sullenly. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible end. But note at the end here, uh, and this is the blackness of this, um, Othello calls for damnation upon his soul for what he's done. This is uh, um, almost the worst thing imaginable. He totally destroys him, and Cassio sits there, or Ra Iago uh, deprives him of his humanity and of his soul in the end. So he's a sort of a diabolical character. Anyway, we end with that. Um, I'll stop off with that since I spoke too long. <laughs>